Today's episode is brought to you by AOS Kitchens, the South's leading outdoor kitchen design and installation specialists. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Meet and Greet Barbecue podcast. Today we speak to Adam, also known as Shropshire Lad. Uh, we cover things like getting into catering, uh, sourcing local produce and also foraging. It's a fantastic talk and we can't wait for you to hear it. So without much further ado, here's Adam. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Meet and Greet Barbecue podcast and today we have Adam with us. Adam, would you like to introduce yourself to everyone because Owen and I are so excited to speak to you. Oh, thank you, man. Yeah, hey, uh, Adam Pennell, known as the Shropshire Lad on all the sort of social channels. Uh, so you can guess I'm from Surrey. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> um, and yeah, um, just like a live fire cook, try to use as much local stuff as possible. I know that's very cliche these days, but I'm surrounded by wicked stuff, great people, beautiful landscapes. I love to be outdoors, love to go fishing um you know and just eat nice stuff over fire really and yeah that's that's me but i guess we'll, we'll delve a little bit more deeply into it as we go right yeah yeah absolutely i don't think it's cliche well i don't think it's there's nothing wrong with that cliche i think it's it's, it's good to celebrate what's what's in your local area right if we're talking about oh. food miles and all the kind of stuff around the environment it's a yeah. winner to have what's on your doorstep straight off the bat Oh, of course, man. I mean, like, yeah, absolutely. There's nothing wrong with it. I wouldn't, have, couldn't agree more. And I, it is absolutely what I try to do a lot. I mean, obviously, it's not always possible, you know. And we're, I'm a realist as well. Um, but you know, I sort of, you always use my local butcher for everything. Kind of, you know, um, try to get as much local seasonal vegetables as I possibly can. Try to find lots of alternatives for things uh, that might be in traditional recipes that you know. Um, what might have to be flown here from the other side of the world, the stuff that we can, you know, replicate from that, that's from Britain, then I, I, I really, I buzz off that a little bit, you know, little tips and bits and pieces. Um, found a re great one recently. Somebody must have been on Instagram. So I did a green mango salad or so green mango, green papaya salad, mm -hmm. both quite similar. Um, and I made one on, I think it was on my YouTube channel, with a green mango that I bought from the Indian supermarket down the road. And somebody messaged me and said, look, I found out a couple of years ago that you can re replicate it almost the perfect uh, replica of that is uh, grated Swede. And I was like, that can't be real. And like, really? I tried it. And yeah, because it's like once it's dressed with the fish sauce and all this kind of stuff, mm -hmm. it's kind of like, it's more about texture and it's kind of like a starchy, crunchy texture, basically. And Swede is like, you literally can't tell the difference. So I'm like, blown. So I'm doing this all the time now. Like, Bought more Swedes in the last few months than I probably have in my entire <laughs> life to, to grate and go to slaws, basically. But yeah, so stuff like that is really cool. I think, you know, not necessarily just about it being a, a Swede from Shropshire, but just the fact that it hasn't flown from, you know, from Thailand or whatever um, is a good thing, right? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And have you found through that kind of experimentation where things like cabbage in replace of a papaya or mango has surprised you is there other things that you've done that you think well i'm not sure this is going to work but actually it's it's actually worked out very well in in, in terms of an alternative yeah so i saw I, I the other day um so i've been doing a bit of work at pub in the park and um funnily enough so so uh, there's a guy i don't know if you've heard of a uh, chef called andrew pern and he was um He's basically got a Michelin star place where he had, unfortunately, the, the main restaurant burnt down uh, at the beginning of the year, like oh. a listed building. That's another story. Anyway, Andrew's there um, vending, right? And and so he's supposed to do a demonstration. A lot, a lot of the chefs who are, are, are selling the food there, well, that's the concept of in the park. They kind of get these big chef, chefs come in and they do like pub food. He couldn't do his demo, but for some reason, um, he has the actor that played Ian Beale working for him now on the yeah. counter <laughs> yeah um adam would how random is that yeah right, proper random and so andrew couldn't do his do his demo so he's like so he says to adam who isn't it ian beale 
we just caught him in in the end. It was so much easier. <laughs> <laughs> and he's, he's a good sport. But um, he said, can you do my demo? And he's like, he, he's basically working the front counter. So he doesn't even cook, really. Um, <laughs> so he raided the fridge and we did, we kind of, we made tacos. And he basically, he brought over a load of stuff that he'd found in Andrew's fridge. Now, Andrew's from York. Um, so they cook a lot of game and stuff. So he brought over like pheasant and a few other bits and pieces. But he brought these like, these peas that kind of had like capers and a bit of chili and all this kind of stuff for it. And I was like, that's almost like guacamole in a way, you know, mm -hmm. especially to go with something like pheasant. It probably works better. So that was quite cool. And I thought, you know, I'm doing a taco pop up. I've been doing taco pop ups. I did one last night. I got another two more. So I nicked that idea from Mark to go with a fish, with a fish taco. So I like the idea of if you, you know, obviously just putting peas in a taco is not going to work, but like, I'm going to play around them a little bit, almost like a, a version of mushy peas, macho peas, you know, that you get in Nando's. That kind of vibe mm. is going to replace the, 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 the avocado. You know, the avocado is like the devil's fruit now, isn't it? Everyone is like, <laughs> yeah. you know, it attacks the vegans with the avocado um, argument and stuff. So I just thought, I'm not going to put any avocado in my tacos. So that's kind of going to be the replacement for that. So, yeah, stuff like that, really. It's just, I think it's quite interesting. And it, that just came about by accident, by doing a demo with Ian Beale. So it always comes out of the blue, these ideas. If I think if you go looking for it, it doesn't it's necessarily, you know, jump you jump and hit you in the face, but kind of, yeah, just as you go along doing things, you kind of find these these little alternatives. And I I, I buzz off those, you know? It also what? helps that you've got a good story to go with it about doing it with Ian Beale. Well yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I was going to ask you about that later in our conversation, but since you brought it up, the, the Taco Tuesdays that you're doing at the Ugly Duckling, how did that yeah. come about? And is that something that you want to be doing more and more often? So basically, I, can't, I know the owner of the, of the place. Mm -hmm. um, well, I met him for, through being in, involved in food and he invited me to go and do something over there. Uh, it was, um, it would have been August 19th. Mm -hmm. uh, and my my daughter was born on the 1st of September and it was like the third week in August and I was just like look at the missus and she's gonna she's gonna explode basically and I was just like I really I can't so I so I cancelled it um, mm -hmm. and then obviously Covid hit so we didn't do anything throughout that and then he just messaged me a couple of months ago and said do you want to revisit that and I was looking at my diary and it was like really I'm really busy um like nearly every i think every weekend till like november or something stupid is booked in with i with something um so i was like i really want to do something but i don't know how we're going to fit it in and then i thought ah well i love i've just like the last sort of year really enjoyed making tacos and, and lo looking at a lot of mexican food and sort of taco tuesdays is a thing and like he's just but basically spent a lot of money on that this amazing outdoor area and last night was the was the debut so the first time it was properly used mm -hmm. um so but he i guess he wanted it it, it was it's going to be quiet on a tuesday night right so this pub is on a country road in the middle of nowhere really it's not like in the, in the middle of a town so tuesday nights are not a busy night so the you know for them they, there's nothing to lose really by 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 doing it and hopefully people will come along they saw the saw how beautiful i don't know if you saw it on my stories but it's a really really amazing job he's done at the place and like obviously create a bit of a vibe there on a tuesday and then people will come back and come to the pub again it's a great pub they just got a rosette um so it's just i guess for him it's a good bit of pr mm -hmm. and for me it was like it's a tuesday night we'll see what happens but uh we did really well man like it was uh basically we we were back we were on the back foot and i started maybe 10 minutes i was supposed to start at five started at 10 past five there was already quite a queue at 10 past five <laughs> and then basically wow. we were still we we're still like we hadn't worked through the checks once still at half eight we were still constantly churning them out so and then it kind of petered out because it was just a tuesday night but yeah it was good and i think that a lot of people sort of said that they're going to come back next week so um i'm going to prep for a bit more but we pretty much sold out of everything last night there's a few bits few bits left but not a lot so yeah, it was um, it was good. I really don't know what to expect. I mean, I could have been left with a whole load of food last night. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, it was uh, it, it went well. It was fun. Fantastic. Go on now. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> um, so I was just about to. Are you are you from a food background? Have you sort of been a chef before? Or is this something that just started off as a a passion and a hobby that's grown into, I suppose, a career for you now? Yeah. So 
Well, I've only just finished working full time. So I finished in February. I was a full time youth worker, um, ran the youth service over in Shrewsbury. Um, and I've always been in education, really, but I've always been fanatical about cooking. Uh, often use that skill working with young people. So, like, uh, before I've trained as a youth worker, so I, I was professionally, I started, I went to uni late in 2009, giving my age away a bit now, but I was sort of in my, in my 20s. Um, <laughs> and graduated 2012. Pre previously to that, I was working in school, well, and during during the time I was at uni, I continued to work there, working, teaching um, the kids who basically, I'm allowed to say this now because I'm out of education, but basically the kids who weren't going to get the schools their five A to Cs were kind of like yeah. pushed in a little corner yeah. and given, yeah. you know, um, what's it, like vocational subjects to kind of do. So I was teaching those kids how to, how to cook stuff then. Um, we were like foraging on the school fields and doing all this kind of stuff, like cool stuff, really. And it was good because it wasn't a GCSE that I was teaching, and I was I never a qualified teacher. We were, it was just free to just teach them whatever. So we built a pizza oven and did all this cool stuff. What so life skills? Kind of, Great life yeah, skills. Life skills. Yeah. But mine it was always based. Mine was it was a food lesson still, but mm -hmm. it wasn't like a, it wasn't like learning food technology, which is learning about the food industry and all that kind of stuff. It was just stuff that these kids would engage with. Um, but previously, so basically getting into this, so I have always been a fanatical cook, uh, since about the age of 10. My dad was also a youth worker. So that's kind of how I knew about the profession and got into the profession. Um, but youth workers generally work in the evenings. Um, he's a really good cook, but was never really around to cook dinner much. Mm -hmm. Um, and my mum's a terrible cook, unfortunately. Sorry, mum, <laughs> for watching. But like, she was not, she's not the best, bless her. And because dad's so good, so he would he'd always cook for her. And she, they would eat later because they were obviously, she'd wait for him to finish. He'd come in at nine or whatever and they'd have dinner. But so I just started basically cooking dinner at home myself using his ingredients. You know, his, his kitchen was pretty well equipped. So it was always quite good. And then started, as I got older, started having my friends over for dinner and all this kind of stuff. So one of my friends really liked my food. Well, a lot of them did really. Um, and he likes making YouTube videos. So he said, do you want to, make some youtube videos you cooking i was sort of like okay like it, it was not something i've ever even considered um so we started we made this this video and i remember standing in this it was like in march and there's a load of wild garlic growing near near where we live and i'm standing in this patch of wild garlic for about half an hour 40 minutes trying to get a line out of my mouth <laughs> like a line i just couldn't just couldn't like couldn't do it i just kept fumbling and just was all over the place but like we persevered and did a few, and this was still just cooking in my house. There was no, there was no fire element at this point. Um, and then, so I, at the time I was in between relationships. So I kind of gone back to mum and dad's early thirties, you know, it happens to a lot of us, mm -hmm. um, you know, sort of readjusting what we're going to do next sort of thing. Anyway, got with my current partner and we moved into the house I'm in now here. And basically the kitchen was just a shithole. It was just like horrendous. There's like, tape all over the oven and it was like <laughs> i can't i can't film in here so what we're going to do is we're going to do some barbecue stuff so i did start cooking a few dishes on a barbecue and by this point i just i hadn't set up a page or anything really it was just me posting it onto my own facebook page i wasn't even on instagram or not i think i might have had a personal account but not a food account uh and because it was shared by fr my friends and friends of friends somebody at could i fireball saw, saw it and they were like, oh, like, we like what you're doing. Would you come and do some stuff for us? They, they're, they're a local company. So there's only down the road, you see. So I went mm -hmm. to meet them and they gave me a Kadai and sort of said, you know, would you do some videos for us? And also we've, we've just sponsored Taste of London. Will you go to London? We go down to London and do a demonstration on the chef stage. So I'm just like, <laughs> really? <laughs> so, wow. Yeah. Within a couple of months, literally within like two, within two, three months of me, my friend getting me to do this YouTube video, I was like, in, find myself in London on stage with Christian DJ Barbecue doing this demo like and, uh, and <laughs> that's it's a just, baptism of fire yeah and it's literally just gone from there just one opportunity after another and now here I am full-time doing it and it's crazy um but I love are you it. loving are you loving I was gonna say you're loving every minute of that oh man it's great I mean 
I, I, I loved my job as a youth worker. I really did. Like, but it got to the point. So they, they were so good to me um, at Shrewsbury Town Council. They kind of, as things were growing, they could see, you know, like, especially locally, I was in the press a lot and doing bits and pieces locally all the time. They could see what was coming, I guess. And, and they were sort of saying, you know, take as much unpaid leave because I smashed through my leave within about three months every year because <laughs> I was just doing stuff. Yeah. So then they were letting me take unpaid leave. So if I, obviously if I was doing a job that was going to pay, I could just, it would work out for me anyway. Um, but it got to the point where I felt like I was just keeping the, the service ticking over and not developing anything. And it just wasn't right. And, and I don't, now I've left, now I've finished. And I wait, I stayed on until I was replaced and all this, you know, I gave them loads of warning. We had great conversations about it all the way through. So it's not like I just sort of dropped the, you know, dropped the um, 30 days notice on them or anything like this um but now i've finished i just like i don't know how i did that for like for two years or whatever it was <laughs> yeah. um it's just like yeah so now i can just focus on one thing which is this which is still lots of things uh but i was in the back of my mind had that i was still supposed to be doing a, quite a responsible job as well you know before um yeah so yeah it's nice to just be focusing on one thing for sure yeah <laughs> and so I think you you mentioned earlier on when we just started about Pub in the Park, which is obviously a series of events that are going on across the country. I think it's Tom Kerridge's event, isn't it? These are expanded for this year. So are you uh, are you involved in every every location this year, or are you? Not every location. Basically, um, I'm doing six out of the nine, so mm -hmm. I'm hosting most of them. Um, but I've kind of. Yeah, it's a bit of a because it because it goes on tour. Like, I so I, they they picked me up last year. Uh, they they just decided they wanted to try this fire pit stage out and picked me up. In, so did two in September. Just the last two that they did was Chiswick and Marlow. Um, I did for them and kind of I guess for them it was a little bit of a test as well to see if it was going to work, see if I could work with them and you know all this. Um, but it went really, really well. Um, like I get on really well with everybody, you know, who organises it and stuff. And and it is quite. A, I know it's again is another cliche, but they're like a little family. And it, you know, if you kind of get on in there, it's all good. Um, and uh, you know, I, I get on with everybody there. So I've been quite sort of involved in helping them to sort of to develop it, and introducing them to some sponsors, and kind of like um, finding people who could host when I couldn't. Because there, there was three dates where I'd already got stuff in, like friends' weddings. This weekend is Warwick, and I'm cooking for my butcher's wedding. Um, she booked me a long, long time ago. So <laughs> she probably, I think, if, uh, if I didn't do that. Um, and, uh, yeah, so, I, so I'm kind of, you know, I'm not working for them. But, like, I, I, I feel, I, lo I love it. You know, I, I think it's a big, I think it's a good thing. I think it's going to go from strength, strength to strength. And so... Yeah, I kind of feel a little bit involved with it, you know, rather yeah. more than just a host. Hostess with the mostess. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. And uh, do, you, do you find a difference between, uh, or much of a difference between something like you were doing that pop-up uh, Taco Tuesday, it's a, you know, a local pub, to hosting a pub in the park? Do you prefer the big stages or do you prefer, you know, something a little bit more intimate where you can really talk with the people? How, do you have a preference you know in that respect? I guess like those are the, my two favorite things. So I either like I love I love now like weirdly like I love filming. I love live stuff. I, you know I love I love being on that stage and, and I don't feel nervous at all anymore. Like I used to. Um, I just love it. I do, I do enjoy that. But equally, I love feeding people and like those Taco Tuesdays. You know, after I've paid my staff food, whatever, I don't make a huge amount of money from them. But like. I guess there's this whole thing about if you're seen as like an Instagram chef, I suppose, it's like that you can't go out and feed people. And I'm like, I fucking can and I will. Yeah. <laughs> and, like, you know, I, I and and hopefully, well, generally, like my feedback's always pretty good, you know, and, and like a lot of people are sort of look at people who are blogging or whatever they, they couldn't do that, you know, you see it all the time. They couldn't do that for for, for high numbers. So I so I go and do it basically. Um and and so a part of it, I suppose, is a little bit of just allow, allowing people to eat my food and and you know, you don't wanna this is when I obviously it started all online. Um, but I felt like that from the beginning, really. So I, I registered after 
maybe six months of, of doing stuff just posting my dinner up, I guess. Uh, I registered with my the EHO, did my first pop-up. That would have been 2018 now um, in my local pub. And it was like, I guess there'd been a bit of hype built up because I was, I, it's where I drink as well. So it was everybody from the pub plus <laughs> who started following me turned up and it was like, it was chaos. I didn't really know what I was doing. And we, we, we did all right. But like now I feel like I've got some really amazing people who work with me um, and like, you know, they make it happen to the point where, you know, if I do a tasting menu or something, I'm generally in with the customers and they, I know that they're making it. It's like a well-oiled machine at the back, you know, they're, they're brilliant. Um, so I buzz off that, you know, I love, I love feeding people um, as well. So I don't know if I could choose if I had to do one, um, I guess the, I mean, the, the problem with catering is it's a real graft, you know, uh, especially if you're like, you don't have a restaurant, so you, you mobile like me, you've got to remember everything. You've got to take everything with you. But it's like the bits that people don't see, you know, my van still needs to be emptied from yesterday. And in the morning, I've got to do all the washing down, cleaning stuff down. And, you know, it's 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 really tiring. Um, and, and it's a huge amount. And the prep is just crazy, you know, um, especially for big the bigger events. Um, so I wouldn't, that's the part I don't like. I love the delivery, I guess, but it's the... That it's it's a lot of work and sometimes can be for not much reward you know i've done a few where i'm like flipping heck i've just done five 16 hour days and you know i could have made the same from an ad on instagram <laughs> you know so <laughs> yeah. you look at it like that it's kind of but it's not the same you know an ad on instagram isn't isn't about building your reputation is it so i get I suppose you know i'll always try and feed people because i do love to do that you know even if it's not necessarily it's not necessarily about how much money you make but just for people to experience what you you know what you love doing i guess we've got something you can really help us with then so in the next kind of month or so owen and i are doing our first kind of cook for a group of people that aren't immediate family and friends uh coming up okay so and this is applicable to people listening as well, because there will be occasions when you're going to be cooking for lots of people. If people know you as the barbecue person, you want to nail it. So what tips would you give someone if they were cooking for a big group of people, whether it be 30 people up to like hundreds? What sort of tips when they're first starting out doing that? It's all in the prep. Everything is in the prep. So prep as much as you can. Don't think I'm going to just chop those herbs when I get there or I'm going to. I'll just be able to do this bit from scratch when I get there. If you could think you can prep it beforehand, go with it preps. Like every sauce ready in the bottle, every everything like ready to go. Have a checklist. Make sure you go through the checklist. Make sure you've got some, some staff, enough staff. Don't have more staff and make less money and make it easy for yourself than trying to like think, you know. Again, if you do really well, right, you're going to, you'll do you'll you'll make more money next time because people will come back so don't try and make money straight away almost like i mean i i, I didn't really make any money from the first few that i did it was I, all i cared about was people having an incredible experience and that's paid off because now i've got loyal people who come to every pop-up that i do you know because it, i, I it, you've got to kind of always put your it's your pride at the end of the day isn't it it's your you know you're you're yeah. showcasing what you're trying to do so don't cut corners you know use the best ingredients you can um and it will it will pay off well it has in my in my case anyway you know um i love that you were like make sure people enjoy it and enjoy it yourself whereas my main worry is don't kill anyone <laughs> <laughs> you won't man you, you won't kill anybody i mean yeah i what do you have you got any idea of what your menu is going to be owen's organizing <laughs> all that <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah i mean to, it's not a paid job or anything i'm just helping out my, i've got a seven-year-old son uh he's part of the local village football team and they're just they want him just to do a little summer barbecue for the end of season so i uh, they just asked for volunteers and i just said yeah i've got you know i've got a couple of smokers and i'll yeah. wheel them down the bottom of the gut you know bottom of the lane and we'll you know i'll help out type thing yeah, they're yeah. gonna buy the meat I, but I will probably say to them at the very least, you know, get some brisket or, you know, something like that. I yeah. think they just wanted I mean, to do traditional burgers and sausages. Considering, considering the menu based on what you're going to do, you know, so something like that, I would probably have something, again, like, so prep-wise, you say bring in the smokers down the bottom of the garden, 
you, we all know what it's like. You don't want to be standing there saying, oh, you know, we've done it in another 20 minutes or half an hour, or hopefully. You know, I would have that meat cooked and hot held two, three hours before they're yeah. going to get there. You know, like 100% because there's nothing worse than people standing around waiting. You know, you've got it. So the, the pulled meats, anything like, so if you do pulled pork or, I mean, brisket's really difficult. I would, I probably, I would, I would, I've never served brisket, I don't think, because it's so difficult to do, to get done well. And, to, you know, I don't, I don't really cook through the, the classic American style stuff. So there's probably yeah. guys who can, but I don't feel comfortable um, serving brisket to people just because it's so difficult to, to catch it the right time and serve it right. And as soon as you slice it, you've got to get it to the customer before, you know, how quickly it deteriorates. But things like, you know, pulled lamb shoulder, pulled pork, um, stuff like that, you know, you can bring that back. Even if it goes cold, you can go and heat it up. It's going to be as good as it was when you pulled it, you know. Yeah. Um, so it's definitely worth considering sort of your menu, really, and logistics of your menu. So you can write... I get carried away, like writing a menu that sounds incredible, and then you think, and then you rewind. And you're like, hold on a minute, how the hell am I going to pull this off? Like mm -hmm. realistically, so it's definitely worth considering that. You know, um, I do like I like to do a tasting menu. You know, so that's that's one of my favourite things to do. And I'm doing one at the Ugly Duckling. I haven't announced the date yet, but I know that in fact I was going to do it tonight. I'm probably too late to put it on Instagram now, <laughs> um, but. Uh, yeah, so that would be like six courses, 50 people, six courses. So that was meticulously planned so that I know that that's deliverable. You know, yeah. you can't just sort of say, I want to do these six dishes and then you're like running around like headless chicken. So, but it all comes with experience. Like the more you do it, the better you get at it, I guess, you know. And I don't yeah, do it definitely. all the time, but I've done a few now. <laughs> <laughs> so, obviously, YouTube. You mentioned you kind of started YouTube before you've kind of got into the live live element, and I, I, you're still continuing with your channel. And I watched one of your recent videos actually, where you went and picked wild garlic. Ah, oh, yeah, the, yeah, okay. I don't know what you mean. You, and then you the steamed, steamer. yeah, and then used it to actually steam fish. So was that your actual back garden as well, where you've cut out? It almost looked like you cut out the grass and just made a little pit for yourself. No, I wish that was my back garden. It's uh, it's actually a very <laughs> a very good friend of mine. Um, did you see the big hut that was behind? If you remember, I don't know if you remember. There's a rusk. It's called a a, um, a pole barn. Actually, it would, it would kill me for calling it a hut. It's a pole <laughs> barn. Okay. Right? But basically, he built that from timber, like that he fell from the woodland around there. He got give, gifted that field to build that pole barn as an education centre. He's just setting it up as a, an alternative education centre for kids who are kicked out of school and stuff. Um, he's just set that up now, but he allowed me to use the place to film that video. And it, obviously, I think it's probably helped him because he's got a little bit of sort of, you know, footage going on, stuff that's happened there. Um, but yeah, it's not a million miles from where I live, but unfortunately, it's not my back. That's my back garden there. Well, the kids' slides <laughs> and shit. Nowhere near as picturesque. Yeah, we have the same. <laughs> yeah. You know what it's like. So, uh, I suppose what I was... A, it was obviously a great video, and but it, it, you, uh, you, before we started recording, you mentioned that you went out and foraged some elderflower, and you've just... You're sat drinking an elderflower cordial. You yeah. obviously went out, you went out and foraged the, the wild garlic. Is that something that's, again, a big part of your... Your, your, you know, your cooking regime that you actually go out and find and forage? Yeah, yeah. I mean, definitely. Well, I mean, so we're lucky. Like, so you see these these trees here. Mm -hmm. One of those trees is a massive patch of wild garlic from like May to, sorry, from February to May. So I use it all the time because it's like, I can literally walk out my front door within 30 seconds. I've got a bunch in my hand. So I'm really lucky. Um, and there's a lake just this way, uh, this way. Uh, which is right outside the house. And there's one big elder tree on the far side. So I just noticed it was in flower tonight. My two-year-old was kicking off at the time, as she does. And so I was like, oh, look, let's some, do you want to make a drink out of some flowers? Just as a divert. I wouldn't probably would have even picked them if she wasn't kicking off. Um, <laughs> but it was a diversion. So she went there and picked, picked the elder flowers. And that was kind of like, yeah. So, so it's kind of happened by chance, I guess. Um, but... Yeah, I mean, I'm not a massive forager, I wouldn't say. I'd like that. Like, so the girl I was with, 
um, in that video, Leah, she's crazy knowledgeable. Like, and some people really are. I couldn't go out and tell you the you know, tenth of the stuff that she knows, but I know the, a few bases. There's a few mushrooms I know. There's a few, you know, obvious bits and pieces like the elderflowers and like berries and bits and pieces that I, I know. And, and if I see them, I'll, I'll grab them. But I don't. Unfortunately, I'd love to have the time to go out foraging um, more, but it's it, you know. It's one of them. It's usually a case of you, you come across it rather yeah. than if you're looking for stuff, then you find nothing. You know what I mean, <laughs> I find, or you just stumble across, you know, a big patch or something by accident. Yeah. So, but I'm an opportunist. If I, if I see something, I'll have it. <laughs> Basically. <laughs> you talked about um, when we mentioned brisket and you said that you're not so much of like an American low and slow. So what is it that you'd like to cook over fire? And why is fire your preferred method of cooking it as well? Um, well, I mean, I do, I love, I love, you know, obviously like everybody loves to cook really nice meat, you know, so I kind of like to try and find alternative cuts, you know. So for example, I tend to cook, uh, my, my butcher knows now how I like uh, chuck to be cooked, uh, to be cut. And it's a big old muscle, there's lots of seams within it. But he cuts me sort of a nice sort of oblong piece, which will cook a bit like a brisket. You know, it's not going to be quite the same, but like it's much more forgiving than brisket. I can use British grass fed stuff that's not specialist and it won't dry out, which isn't really the case with with brisket, you know, mm -hmm. uh, or short ribs or something like this. So um, I, I mean, I do it. I do. I do do it sometimes. But I, I guess because I've done quite a lot of events and stuff like early days, it was like lots of pulled pork and lots of like. You know, if you do an event, it's, it's, it's as I said to you before, pulled stuff is kind of um, just easy. So if you design the menu for lots of people, it's usually something pulled, like whether it's shot lamb or beef or whatever, um, it ends up on the menu. And kind of, I guess after a while, I just, even like I pulled, I did an event for a friend the other day and did pulled a load of beef chuck and it was, I almost made me feel sick, the smell of it, because I've just done it too much. Mm -hmm. And it was sort of like, I don't know, just you don't want to eat it. You ask anyone who does it a lot, you just, that's not what I want to eat. So I guess I just, I, I really like cooking over open fire with stuff. You know, I, I'm really interested in game playing around, you know, and, and you're cooking obviously with game. It's, it's quite lean. It's quite challenging to cook. Um, you, so yeah, just sort of playing around with stuff like that, really. What's, what's available around me? Um, vegetables, um, you know, I, I love to sort of play around and see what we can do infusing things with, with smoke and fire and, and you know uh, like you know, like nick glass's trick i've used it all the time but just when you drop a couple of lit coals and some cream put it out and, and close the jar like, like, like that cream is incredible like and i use that in so many different ways like i last night we had uh, like charcoal infused ice cream on the menu um uh -huh. you know uh -huh. from doing from from watching him do that um so, yeah, I guess just I, I like to do anything that is kind of new and, and like, I, you know, at home, we don't eat the same thing twice very often. I, I experiment on my family a lot. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm always sort of playing around with the, the, the next thing. And it's only really stuff that goes really well that I'm used to that ends up on a menu. But a lot of the stuff at home, sometimes it's horrible. You know, I know you want to talk about sort of and later on, talk about... <laughs> No, let's, 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 let's do it now. Barbecue fails. So the stuff that hasn't gone so well for you then, Adam. Um, as I, try, I, try, I was trying to think the time. I was trying to think of some examples. Um, one, one I mean, a while ago, I, <laughs> for Pancake Day, I was trying to do, um, try, basically with the Kadai, the Kadai's do these huge like uh, paella pan things. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and I thought, I'll do this massive kind of like crap thing for pancake day and uh basically had the kids outside and it was just like everything was going wrong and um <laughs> i kind of tried to roll this uh, i made this this big pancake put all this topping on it tried to roll it and it all just started ripping i saw it ah! i like kind of swiped it and <laughs> and it's not all on film and then like it basically went all up my all, all up the, the, the fence, all up that fence over there. <laughs> yeah. um, and, and it was like, and I, I did, I don't often have a little paddy, but I had a proper paddy. And I was like, what are you doing? And, and then, so 
it, you can look at it. It's on it's on my socials now because we actually have turned it into because we actually managed to turn it into a video that was quite funny because it was real like anger that I mm-hmm. just knack at this pancake up and it's all up the fence it actually made quite a cool bit of content in the end but not what i intended <laughs> but um yeah so that that was that was quite a funny one I've, i'm yet to uh, massively cock up anything that's like public which is touch wood good because i uh, i've got my biggest one ever uh this saturday um i'm gonna be cooking a whole cow a whole dexter oh wow, uh, wow. Over, over open fire um so like yeah, got to stay up with it all night, and I'm quite I'm, I'm really quite nervous about that. So I hope that that's not. How, how do you how do you plan to cook it? Almost like on an asado cross type thing. Yeah, so I've had like a cross. I don't know if you saw um, one of my favorite chefs of all time, really, uh, Chris Roberts, flame baster. He did it a while ago. Do you know him? Welsh guy. No, no. no I no, should no, know him if he's Welsh. <laughs> you should. Like he's should. Uh, he's incredible, man. Like. But he did it. He's got a, an amazing show on um, S4C. Okay, yeah. If you, if you can't speak Welsh, you have to watch it in subtitles. Um, but you should check him out, man. So he did it uh, a couple of years ago. And basically, I kind of nicked a bit of his, his design and then added a few things. that I Because he was the first guy I've ever known to do it, right? And, and I was like, I fancy a go at that. He did it in December as well. Cool. Um, and I, I had a phone call with him the other day, a bit of a pet talk. Uh, cheers, Chris, if you're watching. Because um, <laughs> he was like, it's in your blood, mate, you'll be fine, you'll be fine. I'm like, I, I'm bricking it, to be honest. But um, he he did it in December, so it's two degrees, and it took him 28 hours to cook this. Keep, keeping that temperature and actually like managing yeah, yeah. everything must have been crazy in December. Yeah, I mean, I think he was nuts to do that. But he did it as part of his TV show that he's got, right? So mm-hmm. um, you can watch the whole thing. And of course, being Chris, he smashed it. And um, so I thought, well, if he can do it in December, I'm sure I'll be I'll be fine, you know, to do it in uh, in June. Uh, but it's a bit, it's a lot of pressure, man. There's like 350 people coming to this cool. wedding. Um, yeah. So <laughs> uh, so that's why I'm not a public park. So hopefully you'll 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 sit, get to see this by by the time this comes out, um, it'll be available to watch on YouTube because we're gonna document everything as well um sounds amazing yeah it should be fun uh, i am i am scared so that might be my biggest fuck up <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of me to be, to be messing with but um but yeah the pancake one was was one that stood out uh definitely i mean there's been a load there's been loads of stuff that i just cook at home that's not been not been great you know just mm. tried stuff and it's just like but not particularly interesting to tell you about to be honest <laughs> just Fair enough. And just so, so obviously, you you obviously use lots and lots of different ingredients in, in the things that you try. What is the one ingredient that you couldn't live without? Um, hmm, I don't know. You know, uh, probably onions. You know, yeah. That's, yeah, that's a realistic yeah. answer. I like that. Because no <laughs> one talks about onions. You use it with everything. It's the base of yeah, so yeah. many meals. I mean, the base of everything. Right? Near, near, not, not everything, but like, there's not many decent sources without, you know, curries will just not happen. I mean, mm-hmm. like, that's that's it. That's that's it for me. You know? And I guess if you're talking onion family, that takes out wild garlic. It takes out sprig onions. It takes out, you know, lots of stuff. Garlic, I guess, is... I don't know if it's the same, you know, but yeah. onions are pretty special. And like, you know, it's the first kind of bit of dirty cooking that people do, isn't it? The old dirty onions thrown in the fire. And like every time I do those on the, like one of my master classes or whatever, people are just blown away by the flavour of um, a red onion. Um, there's a guy I go, Martin, my mate, I go fishing with a lot. I showed it him the first time. Um and he, on the next time he went fishing, he turned up with his own bag of red onions just to cook for himself to eat. <laughs> <laughs> he just throwing them in the fire all night and just like, your ass is going to be horrendous, man. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, just, uh, but they are, uh, onions are incredible, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. If you've been looking or thinking about an outdoor kitchen, then look no further than AOS Outdoor Kitchens. They are the South's leading outdoor kitchen design and installation specialists. 
Their extensive showroom is based just outside Bournemouth on the Dorset Hampshire border and as well as a numerous in-store displays also features a live outdoor kitchen where they cook every week on Kamado grills, pizza ovens and all filmed and shown on YouTube. They offer a wealth of knowledge on how to transform your patio into the most incredible outdoor dining area with styles and options to suit every budget and you can guarantee they will be able to create something perfectly suited to you and your home. They stock and supply everything that you're going to need for outdoor cooking, including barbecues, Kamado ovens, pizza ovens, outdoor fridges, and every accessory that you would need to become the ultimate outdoor chef. So if you want to make yourself the envy of your friends and neighbours, get in touch with them today to arrange a consultation and take the first step in transforming your back garden into the most incredible entertainment space. Visit aoskitchens.co.uk So... Yeah. What um, I was actually going to say, I, I was looking on your Instagram and I noticed that you were doing, I don't know if you're planning it on a series, but I think there's three or four videos that you're doing. It's your Black Country series that's um, where you're yeah. trying to recreate local Shropshire dishes. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. kind of a, Black, Black yeah. Country dishes. So I guess my part of Shropshire is just about the Black Country. Mm-hmm. Um, some people would argue it's not the black country like you, just over the border into into Wolverhampton is more proper black country um, but yeah we, we, we started that sorry what were you going to I'm just putting in what were you going to ask me about that <laughs> <laughs> oh no I, I was just going to sort of say you know how I suppose how did that come about on into how did you kind of source these recipes I'm, I'm assuming some are not as well known as others and uh, you know what are you planning to do kind of moving forward with that I'm assuming you've got more recipes to to come as well yeah I've got a few yeah funnily enough I'm, I'm going to be on the radio talking about this tomorrow morning um <laughs> which won't be, it'll be ages ago by the time this comes out but yeah <laughs> <laughs> um yeah that, so they basically there's, so there's this this dish from Wolverhampton called grey peas and bacon and it's rough man it's not a nice dish really <laughs> like, you know, you go to sort of like a proper, proper old pub and you'll find there's great peas and bacon. It's basically like they're uh, these, I forgot what the name, proper name of the peas is, but the, uh, they basically look grey when they're, well, when they're, before they're cooked and when after they're cooked, uh, dried peas that are just cooked down with like chunks of bacon, basically, and, and onions and just a bit of pepper and like really basic, like gruel almost. Um bowls of that and there's this there's this um farm shop which is just on the edge of Wolverhampton called Essendon Fruit Farm and I was I just happened to be up there um looking around one afternoon and saw they were selling grey peas and I was like I've never made grey peas and bacon like and it's like a local dish and stuff so I bought this bag of grey peas and then I started talking so I don't know if you know Phil uh Brew Shack Barbecue Phil um but he is basically from Wolves as well, down the road, and he's like a good friend of mine. So I, I messaged him and said, I'm going to do this, like, I'm going to do this great piece of bacon dish, but I'm going to make it barbecue. So I, the, the fruit farm, they gave me um, a belly, uh, cured, like bacon cured belly. Ooh. So it was essentially like, you know, belly pork, but it's been through the curing process. So mm-hmm. I smoked that like I would a belly pork, you know, and sliced it so it's just, just about to fall apart. And cooked it down with the and and, and cooked the beet the beans underneath it, sorry, the peas, even the grey peas underneath it, and kind of made this dish. And we thought, ah, let's start doing the let's do more of this. It was it was cool to do. So then so I said to Phil, well, I, I do one, you do one, and we'll we'll do that. So we've been alternating. So he does one. Every time I do one, he does one. We just like take it in turns mm-hmm. because he's local as well. Um and yeah, so so I've got I did that one and then um I was like, oh, I'm going to look at, see if there's any books on this. And I found this book. Um, uh, I forgot what it's called now. It's not even here. Like, it's quite a long title. It's something like um, uh, oh, Black Country Food and Life from the uh, Turn of the Century. Mm-hmm. Uh, a Feast of Memories, it's called. That's it. Black Country Life from the Turn of the Century. So it's sort of like, you Rolls know, off the tongue. year old <laughs> recipes from around here. And like for those people who don't know, the black country is basically like around here is the birthplace of industry. So that's right why it's called the black country because it just basically everywhere was covered in soot. 
mm-hmm. from all the all the you know the the industry that went on here. So it's a lot of like very very working class you know stuff. It's poor poor people's recipes and like lots of pork because everybody had a pig kept at the time. Um, you know, quite very hearty stuff, very high fat, very high carbohydrates because it was about like keeping you going, you know, in the in the pit or wherever it was you were working. So, you know, some of the recipes in that book are pretty grim, um, and you know, <laughs> I wouldn't want to replicate them to be honest. Like <laughs> brains and all this kind of stuff, which might be some of people's treat. Phil, he loves he loves awful, so he he's been doing all the awful ones. <laughs> like, he did like stuffed lamb's hearts the other day. So it doesn't sound too bad, but like. I'm not mad into awful, so I've just been trying to cherry pick the ones that sound like I could turn them into something people might actually want to eat. Um, and so, so yeah, so I've done four now. Uh, the, the, the best thing about the West Midlands, if you don't know, is orange chips. So battered chips, you batter the chips, and these like it's like a luminous orange batter that nobody really knows what's in it, <laughs> in it, and they look horrific, but they're so good. Like if you like oh. batter bits. It's kind of like your chips are just coated in batter bits and oh, incredible. So I, I made a version of them and then I went to visit the, the Mecca chippy that does that in Bilston, um, Wolverhampton, uh, <laughs> to celebrate the Jubilee, actually. It was on the Thursday for the Jubilee. <laughs> we went to Bilston, which is like not somewhere you really go to for a celebration, but <laughs> went, went and got the, or, the original orange chips. My chippy in Telford here does them um, and they're pretty good, but there they they're fried in beef fat you know they're, they're still it's been the same since 1975 um they're pretty naughty so i mean yeah, i've never heard of them before you know orange chips yeah you, like, and they literally are bright orange man um have a look there's a there's this thing on my instagram I, you, you'll be able to see my version and the proper ones that mine don't look anything like the proper ones but i thought i'd have a go anyway because the thing is there's nobody knows the recipe of how to actually do it it's like a secret between the chip shops so i've had to like try and make them orange and you know just with my own knowledge of, of food really <laughs> rather than following any recipe but uh so yeah it's been it's been good fun to be fair um and apparently they were talking about the latest one that i did on uh bbc west midlands this morning wow. and so then the producer rang me this afternoon and said they've been talking about your recipe this morning will you come on tomorrow so I'm going on there tomorrow to talk about that, which is which is cool. So it's 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 generated some conversation, and like I just started TikTok recently. Uh, I was late to the party and was kind of finding it hard. It seems like everybody grows so fast on there. Um, I wasn't really getting t- like much um, interaction, but the the Black Country recipes have have done far better than anything else that I've put on there. Um, so yeah. there's definitely an appetite for it. Excuse the pun. <laughs> It's it's encouraging people to have a go. That's what we talk about all the time on the podcast. You don't learn and you don't improve without taking a risk and playing with ingredients and flavour. Um, Absolutely. Talking about fails earlier, I accidentally really oversmoked some um, hash browns last weekend. I I'd right. smoked a chicken probably two, three days before. And the way I set up, I try and save any coals and wood that I've got in the Camado so I can reuse them the next cook. Hadn't okay. realised how much was wood was in there and destroyed these hash browns. They just <laughs> taste of like smoke. And I'd never over smoked something before, but you learn it's from doing when that. You do, isn't it? Oh it's god, really it's horrible. So yeah, bad when yeah. you do. Um, I've done it a few times. How do you control your ingredients when you're trying things out? What do, what do you do? How do I control them? Yeah. So if you're thinking of trying something new, do you dive straight in or do you slowly start and then ramp up different flavors on other cooks? How do you how do you play with those? I, I mean, I normally do a little bit of research, probably. I mean, it depends on what it is. You know, if it's something that's in abundance and is uh, and is cheap, then I'm more more inclined to, you know, experiment with it than if it's something that's going to cost me a lot of money. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> um, because you don't want to, you know, you obviously don't want to cook some like a, so a nice big cut of meat that maybe you've not cut before you probably do a little bit of research whereas you know if you're foraging something that you've never tried and you've got a load of it and it's free you'll play around more i suppose so mm. i guess it, it really does depend on what that ingredient is um but also try to do like something quite basic with with things first so like you actually get an idea of what something tastes like rather than like i don't know if you let's just say if you're using wild garlic for the first time 
Mm-hmm. And you decided the first time you use wild garlic, you're going to put it in a curry. You're not really going to get an idea of what wild garlic tastes like, are you? Because there's so much else going on. So mm-hmm. I think, you know, you might want to do something like maybe put it in some scrambled eggs or like just something quite simple where you're going to, it's, you're going to allow the flavour of that ingredient to come through. And then you can start thinking about what it might work with, I guess. So that's kind of how I answer that, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, to just get to get get an understanding of what of it by stripping it back and not using too much, of, you know, not 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 using too much else with it straight away, I, I suppose. But it does it does depend on what the ingredient is, I guess. I actually want to move completely away from ingredients for for a second. Yeah. We've spent a lot of time talking about <clears throat> live fire cooking and um, ingredients and recipes, but. We actually, what, what do you cook on? You've mentioned the Kadai fire bowl, but what, what other, you know, uh, barbecues or pits do, do you use? So I, I'm in the, the fire squad. So I, you know, I use a, a Kamado Joe. Um, and like, to be fair, when I got that call, I've been working with them for like three years now. And it was, I was still working, sorry, this lights are getting worse, isn't it, Um Apologies for that. Um, That's right. Yeah, so when I got first got that call, I was still working full time in the youth service and kind of just starting to like see a business emerge out of what I was doing, really. Um, but like a youth worker salary isn't a big one. And so I always saw like a ceramic grill as something that was like maybe I'll be able to afford afford one when I retire. Do you know what I mean? Like it was not something I really thought about using because I just thought I'm not I can't afford just they're not cheap are they right and and no. I was just like I'll be able to afford one of those and I was like surely it can't be any better than my drums and and my kettle or whatever you know um but then I got it and now it's literally like parked up by my my back my kitchen like I, I haven't got a fancy fancy cover or I'm not no cover whatsoever but like it's great because even in a storm you can be I, like, open the back door quickly do what i need to do shut the back door the kj sitting right behind the, the back door you know um and i use it almost daily uh just because it's so convenient right i mean i can literally mm-hmm. lean out i've got a loof lighter and just light it 45 seconds open events go and do a bit of prep in the kitchen come out and it's ready to go and it's just like you know they're they're, they're, they're brilliant so you know I use that a lot. I really enjoy using the little yakitori grills as well. Mm-hmm. Um, so a friend of mine um, runs Chef Slucker. I don't know if you've heard of that. Uh, but he basically, I think he's one of the very few people who imports Japanese um, yakitori grills from Japan. He does knives and bits and pieces as well. But he's down the road. So like I get bits and pieces from him. You know, he's always saying, try this, try that. And like, I love that kind of style of cooking. I love anything that's kind of, I mean, the Kadai, the Kadai and, and the Yakitori are both great because uh, I love open fire cooking, but also they lend themselves to being social. There's something you can sit around and share stuff and kind of people can have a go. That's what I like to cook on, really. Um, you know, it, there's no theatre with a Kamado. Um, whilst it can do an amazing job and can do something that you've got that, once you've got that <laughs> lid, the possibilities are endless, aren't they? But, yeah, you know, there's something about cooking over open fire. So anything that allows that, um, I love, really. Should we um, should we jump into our barbecue bingo where we yeah. try and uh, hopefully give you something good to cook for us? Yeah, sounds good. I love ready to <laughs> cook. <laughs> <laughs> so what I'm going to do is... Although we call it bingo, it's actually just a spinning wheel. But uh, let me just um, share the screen so you can see it. Oh, it always talks it down. He always talks it down. But I love this part of kind of the podcast because it it takes the guests out of their comfort zone unless it's someone like you who's cooked everything. Um, but, But the whole point is it completely takes away the choice. So there's a number of kind of different options on the spinning wheel and whatever it lands on, we'll ask you to cook, not tomorrow. So you've got a bit of time to put it together, of course. And uh, we just ask you that when you post it, if you put hashtag barbecue bingo, so people can find it. Um, but hopefully you can see the spinning wheel now. Is there anything on there that really sticks out to you? Bidget pie, what the hell's that? Uh... I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> well, I put it on there. So I was doing a bit of research earlier, 
And uh, apparently a fidget pie is a, a Shropshire dish. <laughs> Fucking course it is. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> oh man i've never heard of it <laughs> <laughs> to be fair i could have just googled it and someone's just sent me down the wrong uh, to give me some false information oh, so but you, you put that in for my benefit i did <laughs> oh, okay fair enough well you know I, what we'll make that well no i've got i suppose got to land on that but i will look into that and if it is a thing i will do it for you as well how's that <laughs> I love, I love how that that option's gone down like a fart in a lift. <laughs> I would spend time looking for something relevant. <laughs> um, what about um, my signature dish? So we always say to people, if it lands on that, you pick the thing and cook that you're most well known of, or for, or you're most proud of. What would that be for you? Would that be tacos, or what would you think? No, I think um, it's the dish that I just put in Christian's new book, actually, uh, in DJ Barbecue's new book, Firepiece, mm -hmm. and it's it's my signature honey jerk chicken. Um, yes. It always goes down really, really well. Uh, it's really easy to do. It's very accessible. Um, you know, I live in Shropshire, and things like um, Scotch bonnet chilies are not easy to come by sometimes mm -hmm. um it's all right if you live in london or something like this probably but around here it's not that easy so this basically uses a very well-known sauce in the supermarket to replicate those flavors and it's a you know I, I, that's how i do it even on mass now that's what i use i don't use the, those chilies just because yeah, this works so well so um that would be that one so that'd be very accessible to everybody as well if they want to try it because it's in that book fantastic okay let's give it a spin and see what comes up Oh. oh, thank! I thought it was going to be carrots, and I was like, "Christ!" <laughs> <laughs> I'll take oily fish all day long. Although we're pretty landlocked here in Shropshire, about the furthest point from the sea you could be, I think. But so trout, trout's oily, right? Trout and salmon are oily, so that's all good as well. Yeah, Owen does your know. choice. Owen hates fish, so Owen's got no idea. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I, it would have been my worst nightmare. <laughs> really? You don't eat any fish at all? Uh, I'll eat some tuna. That's that's about it. That's um, all you do. You're all right. Yeah. I, the thing is, I come from a fishing town in Devon, and okay. my f whole family have worked, on, you know, in the fish industry in some shape or form. Right. I just eliminate it. I've tried so many different types of fish. Shellfish, I just don't like it. Wow. Okay. Yeah. I love it, so that's good for me. Perfect. <laughs> I'll, I'll get oh. on that. That's not a problem. That's a nice one to have. What I'm going to have to do now is, uh, when, <laughs> once we finish this, I'll have to show you my source for fidget pie, and I'll just send you the link. I hope, <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, uh, I yeah. hope it's a thing. <laughs> I really, I really I hope it's it, like I, a piss I, I think <laughs> I'm, I'm starting to think that maybe I have heard of it, and it might be a game thing. Which would be true to Shropshire. I mean, there's a lot of game here, so maybe we'll have a look. And um, while you're on and talking to us, um, I wanted to kind of ask you about the experience that was crazy delicious. What that was, <laughs> what it was like being on there, uh, and everything about it, because I think it's Owen and I's dream to eventually one day be involved in some sort of cooking show for us to oh, show really? everyone how awful that we are. Um, <laughs> but, but how, how was that and, and what was it like for you? Um, yeah, it was. A, I mean, it was an interesting experience, definitely. And obviously, you know, I did well. I, you know, I don't want to say, do you mind to say? Yeah, of course you are. Yeah, okay. of course. It's, it's old now, right? So obviously to win was really nice because mm -hmm. um, you know, nobody wants to go on something like that and be humiliated and lose. And, and, and it didn't go, it didn't start out so well. The first court, first dishes didn't go down so well with the judges. Uh, all the gods. I mean, it was just a bit cheesy, wasn't it? I mean, mm. we had to call them god food gods. And I, for those of you who didn't what didn't see it, it's on Netflix now still. Um, mm. Basically, it's uh, an edible set. We had yeah. to go out and forage ingredients from the set um, to do these certain dishes, and then they were judged by these people, food gods, which was Nicholas Exted, who's like one of my all-time favorite chefs. So it was amazing to cook for him, and I. The other was Hester Blumenthal, and most people would be frightened to hear, but I didn't give a shit about Hester, and it was like all about <laughs> pleasing Nicholas. You know what yeah. I mean? Um, and then Carla Hall, so she's um, a soul food 
um, chef, I guess, and food writer from, from America. And I guess they had someone from Europe, someone from the UK, someone from America because of the whole thing of going on Netflix. So it needed to appeal to mm -hmm. otherwise maybe three chefs from the UK. They might not have known, you know, what it went what worldwide. Um, but yeah, it was it was incredible to be in L3 Studio and see that set and it was enormous like and it was like being it was like being in Charlie and the Chocolate Factory like it looks like on the in the thing you know on, on the screen that's mm -hmm. how it felt and it was really quite like whoa this is a, you know it's a lot of big budget and it was a lot of there's a lot of stuff in there you know mm -hmm. <laughs> and you really you really if you watch me sort of walking up to the to the the food gods who are up in the place that was real you know there's a real staircase it's not like Computer, computer generated or made up or anything that that was so it was it was a crazy experience um and yeah it would it didn't do so well here uh, in the rate in the ratings but when it went on netflix so it was out in like january um mm -hmm. here two years ago yeah. and then went on netflix like six months later but it did quite well on netflix so you know and it's still still get people messaging me now saying oh i just watched crazy delicious it was brilliant you know random people on instagram and stuff so it said so it didn't do me any harm it was it. it was netflix that i stumbled across it before we even reached out oh, really? to you i was like oh, oh i okay. know <laughs> right um, yeah, but it's, um it's keeping you cool as well i, I know you said like there's one person in particular that you want to be cooking well for but with the cameras and everything on you how do you keep that calm well i've done a bit by that point you know, it, was not, it wasn't the first time I've been in front of a camera, you know, I've done little bits and pieces for TV before that and kind of been doing a lot with Henry and, and the guy who originally started doing my YouTube videos. So you, I guess you get more used to it the more you do it. Um, and I guess I, I really wanted to do well. So I just was focusing on the food, really. The hardest part of it all, the whole thing, is that while you're cooking the whole time, so each three contestant, each contestant has one uh, producer basically who's standing, asking you questions, and you have to answer with the question. So it'd be like, "What's your favourite thing to cook?" And I couldn't just say like beef. I'd have to say, "My favourite thing to cook is," right. and you had to remember. So, so because obviously when they don't, you don't hear the producer asking you that, right? You just <laughs> they just want the bit of you saying it. But if you just said beef, obviously that's not going to make make any sense so you have to yeah. they're getting to so you're trying to cook and you're constantly being asked questions while you're cooking and like that is hard because you like i just want to like and there's a couple of times in the final bit where i had to say i can't answer that for me i just need to do this bit because i'm just like just literally and it sort of batters your head because you're just almost being thrown out by by a producer who's constantly asking you questions while you while you're cooking um i also cut myself with my, with a knife within like two minutes of being in the first round <laughs> uh, which threw me a bit as well uh but yeah it was it was a great experience a great experience and the best thing about really to come of it was that i got to go and do a uh, collab with nicholas um at his place extend in in stockholm um mm -hmm. you know last well in 2020 it was now it's a while ago um so to get that experience from it alone was just like mind-blowing really um we did a brunch uh did an english breakfast in a in a michelin star restaurant which was over nice. quite, which was fun yeah hasn't so, he just hasn't he opened a place in london yeah yeah he just opened a place um at the uh the, uh, the scotland yard hotel is it royal mm -hmm. scotland yard scotland yard something like that um yeah. i've and, got i've got his recipe i've got his recipe book yeah the the latest one the uh what's the fire food oh god i can't remember what it's called yeah but it's, no, the, it's, right. it's, it's the one very, that's kind of got like the bronze writing yeah the, the very, the most recent one most recent yeah. one yeah yeah it's great there's some some crazy dishes in there you're probably never gonna ever make but incredible the best thing i ate there was a, a reindeer blood pudding wow it was like a, wow. and it was like it was like a it looked like a sugar cube like black Mm -hmm. but it was it was nothing like black pudding like so don't forget that but it was like it, it makes sounds disgusting when i say this but you put it on your tongue and it like melted like a really loose jelly almost mm -hmm. but it was the most incredible flavor like and it was just made of like smoked reindeer's blood which sounds gross but i was absolutely blown away by it it was 
still stands out to me. It's probably one of the most incredible things I've ever eaten. It was nuts. Really wow. good. You should definitely get to go 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 and eat there. Uh, I've not, I've not been to the London one yet. Um, I will do, but if you can go to Stockholm, it's uh, it's incredible. It really is. Yeah, I, I, I definitely want to go to the Stockholm would be nice, but yeah, at the very least, just we're not that far from London here, so we can just nip in and give it a go. Yeah, I definitely need to go and check out the London London place for sure. I need to try and try and do it while he's here, ideally. Yeah, you want to <laughs> you want to you want to have food straight from from the master, right? Well, yeah, I, mean, I don't know. I don't think it's like. I mean, his head chef is pretty incredible. I don't think um, you know it's a lot of his concepts, but he's a busy man, so I don't think it's that often that he'll be on the pass, you know. Um, but just to, just to catch up, really, it'd be nice. Yeah, definitely. Um, one of the last right. things that we like to ask everyone is: you see so much on Instagram, and you hear people talking about food all the time. But is there anything that you feel isn't being discussed enough? that should be talked about that perhaps we can talk about now or anything that has particularly inspired you that you think is worth talking about and discussing? Um, you caught me off guard with that one. It's, it's more fun to do it that way. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. Um, I think that probably should just be more kind of help for people who are trying to sort of make a career out of food. You know, uh, I'd like to do more stuff with with young people. Uh, you know, I think that one of the biggest problems that the industry has at the moment, as we know, it every like, do you know a single place that isn't looking for staff? Mm. Like, you know, we've had since COVID, like so many people left the left the industry, um, and you know, they're not being replaced. And something, you know, there's a lot of young people out there that need kind of opportunities and they're, they're creative kids who don't necessarily get along with academia but for some reason there doesn't seem to be this like you know um what's the word pathway into a career in, in catering um but at the same time i think that that convers part of that conversation needs to be with restaurants and employees because you know the hours are shit, or they have been. Mm -hmm. Hours are shit, money shit. You get spoken to like shit. Typically, not everywhere, you know. But it's it's always almost a given that that's the case. And like, so there needs to be a kind of shift in basically how how people are treated within the industry, within the industry. But also like encouraging young people to do it, whether it be to set up their own business. You know, I mean, like now with social media, like I never could, never ever could have done what I'm doing now without the power of social media you know every kid knows how to use it but like ne not necessarily in a good way so mm -hmm. there should be more conversations around that and like it's so it's never been easier like with Deliveroo and kind of like all the different things that happen now you can have a go at making a living from from food whether it be working in a restaurant whether it be doing your own thing whether it be blogging whether it be you know whatever like I just think that there should be more conversation around that really and encouraging more young people to sort of to consider it as a career um because i know firsthand that like when you sort of offer that to young people or, or show them you know a little bit they're interested they're keen you know I, I i every single session i ever turned up at in the end uh, as a youth worker the first question i'll be like what are we eating tonight what are we cooking tonight you know they want it and so you know but there's nobody really pushing it. It's not really on the agenda in schools. You know, like home uh, is what? Well, sorry, food technology is shit. It's just about like the food industry, like factory farming and kind of like how food factories work. A bit there's a bit of cooking, but it's not inspiring. Um, so I think there should be more around that, uh, more conversation around that kind of whole, just getting that industry up and running and 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 fresh and full of young blood again. Yeah, you make a great point because I've mentioned it before on on here. Um, I used to do a lot of cooking with my father when I was young. Um, uh, you know, typical kind of where I was brought up. My mum was at home most of the time, but when my dad was back from work, particularly on the weekends, he used to like cooking. He'd always get me involved, so I was cooking from a young age. Mm -hmm. But um, I mean, I even did catering as a GCSE 
um, when I was at school. But at the time, I mainly did that because I was thinking, oh, it's mainly girls going to be on here. It's a good time to, <laughs> to, wait to get involved with that. I like but it. <laughs> I, I, I never really thought or saw what a pathway into that industry would actually be, despite no. even doing some of the qualifications for it. I and mean, even now, exactly. if, if someone said to me, oh, you know, I'm interested in getting into the catering industry or, or cooking kind of professionally, I wouldn't even know where to start them off. Apart from well, going to one, you look on LinkedIn. Get put on a pot wash somewhere. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And that's not going to inspire you, is it? Let's be honest. No. no. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, you're right. It's, 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 it's definitely something that needs addressing. And like, you know, it's in restaurants' interest to be addressing it because they need people like more than ever. I don't, I don't know. I mean, especially, I know in London, it's, I see it all the time from like restaurants that I follow that they're always after staff. But like around here, you know, it's pretty rural. You mm. haven't got like the cream of the crop to pick from either. You know, if you've got a country pub, like there's only really like the, the kids from the village that you can kind of get to work there because they nobody else can get there because it's in the middle of nowhere. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So like they, they need to be, there needs to be something that's sort of encouraging people, you know, and, and I guess it's, it's hard because I get, I get all of the, you know, at the same time we've got like, you know, prices rising on absolutely everything. Like, and I guess that like, you know, these businesses are struggling to survive in a lot of cases. So, so it's a hard, it's a catch-22 almost, isn't it? It's like, you know, the money needs to be there. I, I, I get that. and But I just think that, like, you know, something sort of just to, to show young people. Because I, I, you know, I always wanted to go into food. Mm -hmm. So I lived for five years now. Well, not now, but like I lodged for five years with somebody who's now one of my best friends, where, where I do all of my master classes. He runs a place called The Hunch House. It's massive, well, I say massive hotel. It's, it's you know, they do 120 weddings a year, plus they've got tea rosette restaurant. It's busy constantly. But, like, that guy does not have uh, any life. Like, he, he literally, you know, he's so social and, like, really good fun. But, like, you might catch him on a Sunday afternoon, like, where if everything finished down the pub or whatever. But he loved to, he loved to come to stuff. But I just saw how he basically just had to devote his entire life to this, and he completely put me off going into a kitchen as a professional because I was just like, well, I don't want to give up every Saturday in my life and and work eight hours a week and just look drained. And that's kind of what he's had to. I mean, he's, he's kind of got a bit more of a handle on it now. But it totally put me off, and it's only really like so many people said to me you know, when I was younger, why aren't you a chef? Why aren't you a chef? Why aren't you doing this for a living? And it's like, because I don't want to sign my life away. You don't have to anymore because there are so many different ways. Now the world's opened up with social media and everything that you can kind of make a living from food or from cooking or, you know, and so I just think that some people, just, like so young people could just do with some with enlightening really and in, in some of the, the, the ways. And I guess as bloggers and as, you know, people in the industry, it's partly our duty to to, to go and do that and I feel like I've done a lot of it you know leading up to this point um I still go back you know I'm going back to do some work this summer with the kids I used to work with in, in, the, in the but I always was pushing that you know as a as a professional youth worker but yeah it's it's a big it's a big issue and I think collectively everybody who's in the industry could probably offer something to just make it a little bit better yeah well said thanks <laughs> <laughs> um well adam it's been an absolute pleasure to to have you on uh the, the podcast it's and it's been a pleasure for me as well it's been a great chat thank you no i appreciate it and just actually before we go what um what is there any kind of what, what's next for you uh you know is there any kind of new and exciting things you're allowed to share with us for for the coming months well you fish in it <laughs> yeah <laughs> Um, well, I did share it with you. I mean, the, the cow is the big one, isn't it? Mm -hmm, yeah. um, you know, that's, it would have been, I've, I've been to, you know, the butcher, my, Lauren, she's, she, well, she's the butcher's daughter, but she kind of is the organ grinder of the whole business. She's didn't want me telling anybody really about it. It's, she wants it to be quite a surprise, but this will come out, you know, by the time this comes out, it will be available on YouTube and stuff. So it's all good. Um, so yeah, that, that is going to be, that's big, man. For me, I, I, I don't, 
I've done a lot now, and you know, I do like whole lambs, three or four lambs on the asado, no problem. Done it a few times, feel completely okay with it. This is a different beast, and um, you know, I am apprehensive, so get that out of the way, and, and then it's happy days. Um, but yeah, I'm sure hopefully doing it again. If you're if anybody wants, would like to witness it, eat it, fingers crossed, I'll be doing it at Bestival, Shropshire. Uh, it's a festival. Has always been in Dorset, but they're doing um, they're doing a version in Shropshire this year as well. Nice. Uh, third week in August, so I'll be bringing that there um, for the Saturday. So it'd be like a prepaid. So basically, you can buy a ticket to come and get come on Sunday and get your hot beef sandwich. Was the idea. Um, nice. So yeah, if you want to see it, you want to taste it, then we'll be there doing it. <laughs> I wish you the best. Of luck for you know, so I appreciate it. it's quite a, a big ask to come to a festival for four days for a beef sandwich, but you know it'll be worth it. I'm sure. <laughs> be the best, yeah, the best beef sandwich you've ever had. Uh, you don't say. When you've spent 170 quid on a ticket. <laughs> <laughs> oh, brilliant. Well, no, we're best of luck for for this weekend with the whole cow. We really look forward to seeing you document it. And uh, you said it'll be on YouTube. Yeah, by the yeah, time this comes out it'll be on YouTube so that, that'll be fantastic to see it will be yeah yeah I, I would imagine well so basically it's uh, we're actually going to so I do a bit of work with Meter um, and we're going to it'd be really interesting so we're going to have we're going to use the Meter block and have four probes in different parts of the cow to be able to monitor you know what the levels have sort of happened if it's dropped in the night I'm going to try and stay up all night but I know for a fact the lads I'm with are going to be drinking and whatever and so yeah, that's, that's the <laughs> most nervous part is just like staying sober enough and kind of like with it enough not to fuck it up at like three o'clock in the morning or whatever, but I'm sure it'll be fine. <laughs> oh, great stuff. But yeah, oh, so, it'll be, so anyway, it'll be, it, the, the, the video will be a meter video, uh, but it'll be on my channel. So yeah, you'll be able to sort of see everything um, from start to finish, hopefully. Cannot wait. Cannot wait. Yeah, me either. Brilliant. Well, uh, actually, t t tell tell people what your social handles and channel is called so that they can find you. Uh, it's Shropshire Lad on everything. Um, so YouTube, Instagram, uh, Facebook and TikTok. Don't do Twitter, I'm afraid. But yeah, all the others. Great. All right. well, thank you very much for coming on, Adam. It was great to meet you. No worries. You too. Thanks very much. Have a great one. Cheers. Thanks. Thank you. That's it for another episode of the Meet and Greet Barbecue podcast. Thanks so much for listening. It was great to chat with Adam Shropshire Lad, and he has such a passion for local produce, experimenting with food, uh, fire, and I think it was a really important message around getting the youth back into catering, back into restaurants, and their, and, and creating that passion around, around food. Um, as ever, we want to hear from you, so please get in contact with us through the usual places. Tell us what you want to hear on the, bar, on the podcast, whether it's about barbecue or food in general. Um, if you'd like to help us grow the podcast, please visit our website. You'll see the buy me, uh, the little coffee in the right left hand side any donations that you do we put back into the podcast to grow and bring you more fantastic content also we have an official merchandise store on our website where you can pick up meet and greet barbecue podcast mugs t-shirts aprons please go check it out and until next time keep on grilling Today's episode is brought to you by AOS Kitchens, the South's leading outdoor kitchen design and installation specialists.